Um, so my name is Tudor Rakoff. I'm the manager of the Rapid Hardware Accelerator program at NextMap. And before we begin with the presentations today, I just want to thank Venture Cafe for all the great work they're doing for the startup ecosystem in Philadelphia and other regions. Uh, so thank you folks, Natalie, uh, Kerway, Tracy, you're doing a great job. We appreciate you uh, hosting us uh, for yet another presentation. Typically we have these in, in person, but um, uh, we'll try virtual, see how things go. <laughs> thank you once again for offering to, to host the Zoom meeting and also providing the virtual info tables after the, after the presentations. Um, so I would like to start with an overview of what NextFab is and what we do. Um, so I'll start with a um, one minute video and hopefully this will give some additional time for people to join the session. I hope you can see the screen. All right, I hope you were able to see this and hear the music and everything. Great, awesome. So a quick overview of the accelerator. So um, in 2016, we decided to launch an accelerator program for entrepreneurs who are developing physical products and need um, capital, but also product development support. So since then we've invested in 32 companies. We have put about $1 million in these ventures. And we, we have done this through the Hardware Accelerator program. We run it twice per year, and typically we have four or five companies in the Accelerator. Today we have five of these entrepreneurs graduating from the program, so you hear about their experience um, during the Accelerator. This was our first ever virtual cohort, so it was rather unusual, but I think um, um, these folks did an amazing job um, making progress despite the, the challenges posed by the COVID-19. Um, so, um, after the presentations, we'll have some time for um, additional questions. Uh, we'll have some virtual info tables. And if you're interested in learning more about the accelerator in the next uh, application window, I'll be happy to share more information about that. So um, back to the presenters, we have the five uh, entrepreneurs here today. Uh, they each have about seven minutes to present. Um, they will have some, some time for questions and answers after each one of the presentations. I would encourage you to share your questions in the chat area. Uh, and again, once we're done with the presentations, uh, you have another chance to talk with these entrepreneurs in a small group setting through the virtual info tables. Oops, sorry about that. Um, Natalie, do you have uh, anything you'd like, you'd like to share about the, uh, the virtual tables? Um, no, I'm so sorry. I should have mentioned this in my introduction as well. Um, but I just put um, some information about them in the chat box. So um, the link to where those will be. And I'll put that in again at the end once we wrap up here. Um, and once you come over to um, the networking space, navigate yourself to the second floor. And that's where you'll see um, all the startup tables. Um, and that will make more sense once you get into the networking space. Great. And feel free to find um, myself or another Venture Cafe um, staff member in the first floor if you're having trouble navigating around and we'll help you find Great. the right. So yeah, we'll, we'll have time for the presentations and for the question and answers until about 6.40. And then we're going to transition to the virtual info tables. But before we do that, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge several organizations that have made um, substantial contributions to this program. We wouldn't be able to provide the support that we provide to these entrepreneurs without these companies. So one of them is DLA Piper. Uh, they're a global law firm. Um, they have a very um, good uh, growth practice in Philadelphia and other cities around the world. The other um, sponsor of this program is UPS and they provided some supply chain advice to these entrepreneurs as well as some um, very generous discounts. So um, with that, I would like to invite the first presenter today and I'll stop sharing my screen. The first presenter is Nick. Nick, are you ready to, to present? 
Hey, Todor, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you see the slides? I can see them. All right, great. All right, so uh, we're in Luca Technologies. Um, we are developing smart sunglasses for your windows. So um, daylighting is the number one most requested element in architecture. It um, is beneficial to health, productivity, and even sleep. This is why glass is ubiquitous in architecture. However, 59% of windows are covered all the time. And buildings being the leading uh, carbon emitter in the US, um, in big part due to inefficient windows, uh, that translates to $15 billion uh, lost every year. Um, the problem is that over 50% of US buildings are still going to be in use in 2050, and there's not a lot of solutions uh, to existing building windows. I want to talk about uh, an advanced like uh, like advanced glass technology called electrochromic glass. This intelligently changes tint. Um, there are a number of benefits here to human wellness um, among, you know, reductions in eye strain, headaches, and drowsiness. The problem with this technology is it's wired. So in order to get this um, electrically electrical tinting ability, you have to have wires going throughout the building to connect the windows to the main power lines. So um, that's a really a non-starter in the existing building space and also in the residential space. So, so far, these technologies have really just been um, niche products. What we've done is develop uh, a technology that harvests ultraviolet light. So we're producing in-window electricity for data collection and control of light and heat via electrochromic films. So this technology is uh, protected by five patents. Um, it requires no external wiring or special installation um, and it intelligently responds to local conditions. So you can see an example of our prototype on the left side of the slide. Um, yeah, so this is a wireless smart glass that pays for itself with energy savings. So the first product that we're building with this um, is a retrofitable smart window. Um, it allows for existing buildings to be augmented with first this smart UV platform, which is where you get your power. And then you can add um, an electrochromic glazing panel that controls your tinting. And this system runs on hardware that essentially captures that UV light as electricity and uses it to control the visible light regulation and also has a number of Internet of Things benefits. So you're um, uh, collecting information on your surrounding and using that to inform the user and improve the uh, building operation and the building comfort. So uh, this fits into the architectural glass market, which is 115 billion plus market. Um, we're focused on the U.S. office renovation market. Um, as a beachhead, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, but to, to differentiate us from other smart glass technologies, so the other technologies that are out there are wired products focusing on new construction. So think about your LEED certified um, kind of fancy uh, new construction building. Um, so we're focused on wireless products for existing um, buildings, and we're actually working with these wired UC glass companies to give them an alternative revenue stream. So our market goals are, we think, pretty conservative. If we do 30 100 window buildings by 2022, that's 10 million in revenue. And then if we ramp up to some larger projects of 1,000 uh, 1, window buildings, that'd be 73 million in revenue by 2025. So in terms of how the business works, uh, we're sourcing these electrochromic glass technologies from uh, existing suppliers. And these are companies with um, large amounts of manufacturing, but they're not being utilized because uh, construction has been slowed, especially due to COVID. Um, so we're converting these products into uh, our wireless system. Um, so we're integrating them with uh, the smart UV power and then adding hardware and software um, and then assembling, packaging and delivering them. So we're really um, looking towards uh, Fortune 1000 companies, so kind of leading edge folks. I put here, Microsoft has made a carbon negative pledge and that applies to their buildings, like their entire operation. So this is a way to help um, folks like that reach their, their goals um, in their existing buildings. So other folks would be real estate investment firms, especially those in um, urban settings that need to upgrade their, their aging uh, buildings, and as well as developers who are looking to renovate buildings. Additional opportunities um, really value come from the data that we get out of the system. So every window that's in place, we're able to collect temperature, humidity, 
um, lighting conditions, air quality, even security feature, features like glass breakage. So we're able to take that um, data and feed it back to uh, the building operator, uh, the user, the homeowner, if it's a residential case, um, and really improve the, um, the efficiency, the performance, and the comfort of the space. And then we can also take that data and work with utilities to inform them how, of you know, uh, data usage in certain sectors of the city. As the sunlight comes into a building, we're gonna know before the HVAC turns on that the HVAC is gonna turn on and kind of be able to forecast that demand. So that digital decarbonization is exciting. Um, element of, of what we're doing. So in terms of where we are, um, we are aiming towards doing beta projects later this, this year. Um, we've done a 10 window um, pilot project and now we want to do a uh, commercial project, actual, you know, customers commercial projects later this year. Um, those are going to be smaller projects in the order of 10 plus windows. And then next year we're lining up early adopters. So these are larger buildings, 10, 20 to 100 windows um, or more. And we're hoping to be um, cash flow positive by 2023. And the real way our business model works is that as the project size increases, um, our economics increase considerably because glass is volume dependent and also um, dependent and size dependent in terms of redundancy. So a big building that has a lot of the same windows sizes, that's going to be a great project for us and a way for us to have a, a big impact. So uh, the team, uh, the company was co-founded by myself. Um, Professor Princeton Lin Lu, who is the director of the Anlinger Center for Energy and Environment. So this is a nexus for government, um, industry, and academia to come together and work on issues related to energy and the environment. Um, we also have on the team uh, Quinn Burlingame leading R&D. He's a postdoc in residence at Princeton. Um, and then we have uh, two folks from industry, Lou Pabelski, who is sales and marketing at a market leader um, in the smart glass space, which is Sage Glass. And then Adrian Winota, who is on the operations and product side, and he's actually been had experience at two different smart glass companies. So we're able to have um, a diverse team of not just scientists and technologists, but also industry folks. Um, and we have uh, patented unique technology that we hope can have a really big impact for um, climate action, for upgrading existing buildings, both in terms of saving energy and also improving those spaces for the occupants. So, um, Check us out, um, our website's nluca.com. You can reach me at nick at nluca.com and I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions. Nick, there is one question for you in the chat. Um, can you see it? <laughs> Does the percentage of the tent change based on the amount of light that comes in or is it constant? Okay, so that's a critical question. So the technology that we're working on um, it's able to be either manually or automatically controlled in terms of the level of tint. So that's the kicker. That's why it requires wiring or power or wiring. So there are some technologies out there that, uh, you know, like the, the photochromic glasses, right, that automatically respond to sunlight. That's not that useful in architecture because, you know, going throughout seasons, throughout parts of the day, you want to be able to dynamically adapt to lighting and also the, like what people want inside, whether they want to be able to see out or not, um, especially in a home. Um, so our system, it takes all the time, it's screening ultraviolet light. So the ultraviolet light doesn't get indoors, doesn't damage any of the, um, you know, artwork or furniture or what have you. Um, and then we convert that to electricity. And then we use the intelligent sensing on board and the hardware and an app, you know, smartphone app to control the level of tint. So you can either have it automatically happen. So light sensors say, okay, it's too sunny. We're going to adjust the glare um, or control the glare, or you can manually say, um, I want to take a nap. I want to darken the windows. Um, or I want to see the sunset, you know, I want to uh, clear the windows. So, yeah. Next to the question. Any other questions? Yes. Bruce wants to know whether you manufacture the UV solar cells. Right. So we have um, actually multiple UV solar solutions. Um, we have, they can do different power generations. We are not, we, we're working with third parties to manufacture each, each one of those technologies. And they kind of, the, the window and building market is super fragmented. So you need different products to address different situations. Um, it, I, what I showed was this electrochromic window product, but we're also looking at smart blinds, uh, digital signage and other products like that. So the version that we're doing for the first product um, is being manufactured by um, a partner in Maine. Um, and then we're working with some other folks to scale up some of those other products. So everything is done through third parties. And what Luca does is we have um, a growing IP portfolio and we design the um, hardware, firmware, software to operate the system. Great. 
Any additional questions for Nick? All right, it looks like we don't have any at the moment, but again, uh, once we're done with the presentations, we'll have some additional time that uh, we can use to talk with the company. So we'll uh, do that through the virtual info tables that Napoli is going to set up for us. All right, so the next All presenter, right, thank you, Nick. And the next presenter is Greg Friedman from Goga. Hello, everybody. Let me try to share my screen, see if that works. So I hope everybody can see the presentation. So good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Friedman. I'm CEO of AA Plasma. Uh, you heard from Todor, it's Goga that's presenting. Goga is a wholly owned subsidiary of AA Plasma. Oh, apologize for that. Uh, anyway, so today I want to talk to you about a project that's been pretty heavily funded over the years by uh, recently Defense Logistics, but also USDA, <clears throat> National Science Foundation, Army, uh, NETIC, uh, uh, Soldier Research and Development Center, and now uh, NextFab. Uh, and uh, we're working with our partners, that's uh, Xenex, Santera, Cax Industrial, and Rubber Wrenches. So the project is focused on short pulsed plasma for fresh produce disinfection. <clears throat> First, the problem is, I think, pretty obvious. <clears throat> Food tends to spoil and uh, spoiled food tends to, <clears throat> I apologize, <clears throat> uh, spoiled food tends to cause some uh, foodborne illnesses. Matter of fact, uh, WHO estimates that uh, on our planet, every year, one in every 10 people gets sick from, from their food. 33 million healthy years lost. So you can imagine this is a massive, massive problem that we're trying to address not to mention the carbon footprint and all of everything related to sp spoiled food. Uh, so our solution is cold plasma. We use electric discharge plasma, mix it with water fog and use it to put it in a box like you see in this picture to disinfect whatever you put in that box, including fresh produce. First, let me tell you what is plasma. Uh, so thermal plasma, something that, that in physics is referred to as thermal plasma. Is, uh, you can see it as lightning, for example. That's an example of thermal plasma, man-made thermal plasma. You can see welding, melting, cutting, using electric discharges. So that's thermal plasma. Cold plasma is much more rare in nature. Uh, Aurora borealis, for example, is one such uh, uh, occurrence. Uh, you guys also know plasma TVs, right? That's cold plasma. That TV doesn't melt. <laughs> uh, so it's a much, much, much lower energy than lightning, but it carries a lot of its properties. So it's very high energy, but very low temperature. So what does it do? Cold plasma mixed with water droplets is highly antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal, anti-everything organic including humans. So we have to be careful how we disperse this fog. That's why it's in the box. Uh, but we get a pretty good kill. We get an eight log kill or 99.9999999% kill of, uh, for example, listeria, salmonella, uh, coronavirus, uh, 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 and other pathogens, including fun fungal spores. So we can disinfect the food. Now, who does this benefit? Well, in the fresh produce industry, we're primarily uh, 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 attacking, addressing, working with four different sectors. We work with growers. Growers, those are the people that grow the food. They have very, very good control. They have control of harvesting, packaging. Uh, uh, we offer them ability to reduce or even prevent losses from FDA recalls. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning, we work with rubber wrenches. They were the ones that were named <clears throat> in the most recent FDA advisory about romaine lettuce. Those guys lost uh, 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 many, many, many millions of dollars just from romaine lettuce outbreaks. Uh, next, of course, we want to work with processors. So growers deliver fresh produce to processors. 
those guys usually wash, process, bag, tag, deliver, everything. Uh, they're very high tech. Those of you who have not worked with processors, they, their level <clears throat> of te te technology abilities is extremely high. So they're very receptive to high tech solutions such as electric discharges. Uh, and again, they they're ab we're able to integrate <clears throat> before packaging, during packaging, and after packaging of produce. So our technology may be a good fit in multiple locations. <clears throat> we also work with shippers. Uh, those guys are responsible. Their their main concern is spoilage. So if you can imagine, if we can prolong uh, spinach life by one day. We save them significant amounts of money. Matter of fact, I don't know if you guys know. Uh, my best friend, he's in a fresh produce import expert. He loses about 20% of his produce. He's a shipper. It's been grown. It's been processed. He just ships it, and he loses 20% due to spoilage. How would you like me to save you 20% of, of your <laughs> uh, uh, losses? Uh, but anyway, and of course, of course, you know, I'm, I'm talking to humans here virtually. Uh, grocery stores and in-home use, that could be a potential target. That's the hardest target to uh, address due to regulatory challenges, but that's another one that uh, we're targeting. A uh, question I often get is, can it scale? <clears throat> uh, yes, we can. By the way, that's a picture from uh, Jerry Rava's Rava ranches. He has about 300,000 acres of romaine lettuce. <clears throat> uh, so yes, we can scale. <clears throat> I apologize. I've been talking all day. Uh, so we're connecting. You see this big truck over here? That is a system. It's a 57 cubic meter system used for romaine lettuce chilling after it comes from the field. And this machine <clears throat> that is sitting <clears throat> that is sitting inside of NextFab right now, uh, this machine connects to this and fills it with disinfectant in just five minutes. So we get that eight log reduction on fresh produce in just five minutes in a 57 cubic meter container. So yes, the technology can scale. And with that, uh, uh, please feel free to email me, ask questions. Our websites are, uh, I think they say flying under the radar. <clears throat> so we're trying to keep information to absolute minimum. But if you have questions, feel free to email me at any time. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Greg. There is one question for you from Juliet. Can you see it? <clears throat> Will this process require long-term safety and efficacy studies? Oh, but of course. Uh, so remember, I mentioned that we work with growers, processors, shippers, grocery stores, and in-home use. Those are all regulated differently. <coughs> so if we're going for, <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> so if we're going for uh, in-home use, the regulation is the worst. Uh, while working with growers, regulation is actually the least. Uh, does this work on the surface of food or can it disinfect <clears throat> fruits contaminated internally? Uh, intact fruit will not be contaminated internally. When you're talking about romaine lettuce, romaine lettuce is very specific. When it grows right before harvesting, it actually closes up. So there may be contamination that's not inside of the lettuce, like not inside of the leaf, not in the tissue of the, the, uh, of the fresh produce but it is inside of the whole package. Uh, we are working with a uh, uh, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer is uh, it, we have a publication coming out and it's part of our patent. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, talk offline details with you. <clears throat> uh, Romaine isn't a fruit. A fruit can be internally contaminated. You know, honestly, I'm a bioengineer uh, with a plasma physics and plasma chemistry background. Ed, uh, please, I'm happy to talk to you offline about uh, fruits that can potentially be contaminated internally. I'm not aware of that. Uh, the only fruit I have worked with, I believe it's a fruit, is an apple. 
Uh, I don't believe those get internal contamination and decontaminating them externally is very easy. But again, the sec session after this, I'm happy to discuss. Uh, Carl is asking, are there data available that examines potential degradation of various produce types under cold plasma treatment? We have data for lettuce, strawberries, kale, and spinach. Those are the uh, kind of staple uh, 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 fresh produces that uh, Army requested us to test. Short answer, there is no bleaching, there is no discoloration, there is no chemist, chemical changes to the cuticle of the fruit, to the outer surfaces of the fruit in the time that we treat. If we treat for a longer time, yes, of course we will see bleaching and damage, but not at short treatment times that we're using. Uh, we're happy to test other produce, just nobody has asked. Uh, Ken is asking, uh, what are the very, what is the tonnage of vegetables shipped annually? I have no idea. <laughs> I know that that uh, 57 cubic meter machine that I showed to you, that fits an entire uh, uh, trailer load of produce and that runs every 15 minutes, I believe 24 hours a day. And a small farm will utilize a couple of these machines during the growth cycle. So it, it's enormous weight. So again, we're attaching to the container that's used for fresh produce chilling. Uh, we have a separate system that's attaching to uh, small shipping containers uh, 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 that's rather inexpensive. But it's, uh, every produce is different. Uh, like Ed mentioned earlier, you know, there, there are some challenges with uh, different fruits that I've been in this industry for four years, five years, and I've never worked with fruits. So I, <laughs> I don't even know what challenges they have. Greg, there is one more question from Andrew. If you scroll up, you'll be able to see it. It's about the price point for this device. Uh, Angela, Angela. The question is, what do you think the price point would be for in-home use and how accessible would a product like this be for different income levels? Excellent question. I am not a business guy. I'm an engineer. So with NextFab, we have a different project where we took our fresh produce disinfection system and converted it into a system for disinfection of N95 masks during the COVID pandemic. Parts, parts to build that system are $250. So if we mass produce that system, our cost to produce each unit will be on the order of $100, $150. Now, uh, <clears throat> how much will the business guys sell that for? I don't know. It depends on the market. You have to keep in mind that regulatory approval for in-home use, in order to get the system approved to be used in your home, we would have to spend uh, anywhere from 30 to $60 million. So I would imagine this thing would cost like a good microwave. So a few hundred dollars, maybe in a three, four hundred dollar range. About accessibility to it, I don't know. I'm, I'm an engineer. My job is to make sure it works. It works. <laughs> Great. Any additional questions for Greg? Nope. All right. Thank you, Greg. Great Thank job. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. The next presenter is Gurkhan. All right, thank you very much, Tor. Let me go ahead and share screen. Can everyone see that? Not yet. Oh, now I see it. All right, wonderful. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Gert Kranzuvi, CEO of Revata Solutions, where we have developed an in vitro fertilization diagnostic to improve the IVF pregnancy rates for patients going through IVF, specifically by Die by assessing embryo, oocyte, and sperm quality. So the, the big issue with IVF is that it's a rising, it's in rising occurrence. Over one in eight couples are now being treated. And I've seen, I saw something maybe two, three weeks ago where it's now one in seven couples are being required to, to meet treatment. And, and so this rising rate of infer, infertility 
is also coupled with a, a lack of improvement in the process. So patients going into IVF still experience the same 70% failure rates that they experienced 10, 20 years ago. And the cost is, has moderately decreased, but it's still at about 20K each run. Now, so this, this kind of frames the situation that a, a typical patient is going into the IVF uh, clinic facing, these numbers. Additionally, though, we're seeing a rising uh, amount of IVF use besides the one in seven patients being treated for infertility because of social dynamic changes later in life uh, pregnancy. So this graph here, uh, blue is from 1980 and red is from 2016. And what this graph is showing is that the age of first-time mothers has changed from about an average of 21 years old in 1980 to about 27, 28 years old in 2016. So we're seeing the use of oocyte freezing and some of these IVF tools a lot more frequently. Now the main problem with a good IVF process is what is the quality and the viability of that embryo. There, you ideally want to transfer one embryo uh, in this process, but they'll have a pool of about 10 or 12. So the embryologists visually grade each one, and there's only three categories that you can grade them into, poor, fair, and good. So there's a lot of variability between these cells that isn't uh, identified, and that's shown with a 40% inter-embryologist variance. This, this variance is what gets IVF an experimental uh, tag. People believe that it is not consistent and reproducible, um, and so insurances have failed to provide adequate coverage for it. So what Rovada Solutions has done is we've created a microfluidic biomems chip, which essentially traps embryos into individual channels and into individual electrode pairs. And we then measure a frequency response from the cell. So we input an electrical uh, voltage and, and frequency, and we then measure what that change is on the opposite end. And from that, we can start to assess some of the intracellular uh, makeup of these cells. So we're basically uh, the first single cell or single embryo um, impedance probe. So our device is up against a few other competitors in the embryo selection space, notably pre-implantation genetic screening and time-lapse incubation. Our price point would be about comparable to PGS at about $35 to $3,600. Um, but the main advantage of our, of our tool is that unlike PGS, we don't have to destroy part of the cell to get an analysis and time-lapse incubation can actually be coupled with ours to more than double, or more than that double, improve our efficiency uh, even more so. So the business model is to utilize a consumable. And here is a version of our consumable that would slide right in without the microfluidic adapter on it. And these guys can actually be manufactured and produced at NextFab which has been one of the most time-saving and, and one of the biggest value adds of any, any group that we've worked with, um, most notably because wire bonding these and assembling these is, is particularly tedious. So this need in the human application is also reflected in the animal market. So Jackson Labs is the biggest producer of biomedical research mice in the world. Most of the mice that are used for preclinical trials or have some, some adjustment made genetically were produced by these gentlemen. And there is a common need across multiple species to objectively measure the quality of embryos. Um, pure and simple, it's the economics of their supply chain. How are they sourcing these embryos? They want to be able to only put the viable embryos in so that they only get, uh, they get a higher pup count out. So the animal opportunity is what we're currently starting with, and it's pre-regulatory for us. So we do have a regulatory hurdle, which is coming up in, in a minute, but we want to tackle the animal IVF uh, space, which is a $1.1 billion market first, and then develop and validate and move into the human IVF space. The market, the business model for the animal space is similar to the human uh, business market, business model. And that is primarily 
in that we are selling these chips just at a, a, a markdown. So these, in the animal space, there's less regulatory requirements for how they're produced and how they're, how they're maintained. So we don't, the costs for maintaining and building these units is significantly less. So we're looking at about $25 a chip and the base system being about a 20K system. Now, to be able to, to get into the space, we had to do considerable work with, with identifying how single cells uh, flow in microfluidics, how we can get the measurements out of them and how we could trap them. And to do this validation, we worked with a number of partners generating over 50K in revenue in the process and securing a letter of, re letter of intent for over 100K with Jackson Labs. Now these processes have been able to establish some of our, some of our expertise in the automation, in the automation space. Now our milestones and growth started from initially having a, a field testable unit that was able to start collecting some preliminary data and moving some embryos around. With the completion of the sensor, we were able to then create a feedback loop to create full automation. Finally, we've taken that system and we're now retailing it. So it will be on shelves in laboratories come July. Um, but there is also an additional avenue that we're taking, which is to create these custom biochip applications, one of those contracts of which was previously mentioned. Now, the automation of IVF is, is our ultimate goal, and we're still moving towards that to be able to, to get into the human space. So we see that by the end of the summer, a slight shift with COVID, we want to have the full uh, loading IVF incubation selection done. Of those, we have loading IVF and selection incubation is using a, a heater. Um, so <laughs> that maybe trivializes it a little bit. The FDA strategy for us to tackle this is to go in as a class two medical device, um, Class three being it, there is imminent safety and class two uh, imminent safety concerns. Class two being there are safety concerns, however, they're less severe. Um, so at that point, that would take us about 12 to 18 months to go through the FDA once we actually have the data. Um, so it's a little bit longer to generate the data uh, supporting this in the preclinical space. Then our IP itself is actually maintained and managed by Morrison and Forster. Um, we've also gotten to submit our international PCTs in Europe, China, and Australia as well, three, three hotbeds of in vitro fertilization. Now, we have a partnership here to be able to transition us um, into the next phase of, of our preclinical to clinical studies to be able to actually work with donor embryos once safety has been uh, established and that we can support on a physiological level, what, is, what are these differences that we're seeing within the cells? Um, so the one big concern is that to be able to qualify as a class three or to be one of the requirements for a robust system in this market, is to be able to predict viability, but being in predicting viability, you become a class three device because you're making a doctor's assessment. Our approach is to take the class two, which is simply that we provide a metric to be able to inform a decision. Now, to date, we raised over 475 in convertible loan notes of the likes of which NextFab and IndieBio are both part of, but we've also generated significant support in manufacturing and research and legal um, subsidies. And so this is, this is our, these are our partners who see the benefit of the system and they want to see it in their laboratory, they wanna see it with their partners uh, advancing and developing. Um, now, our team is composed of myself as CEO and founder, Dr. Yushu Bay as CTO, uh, Dr. Sean Chen, head of research, and Dr. Jason Dekarski, our automation engineer. We have, we've been working in, in tandem on this to, to effectively create what we all share as the next big in vitro fertilization technology. That's our common binding goal. Um, 
Our advisors include Dr. Marty Goldberg, SVP of R&D at Talis Bio, Dr. Todd Huffman, the VP of Product, formerly CEO of 3Scan, which was acquired, Dr. Ernest uh, Zarenge, Medical Director of a IVF clinic, and Dr. Kent Lloyd and Dr. Selene Panaccio, both directors of uh, translational, or directors and experts in translational medicine. Um, this is Robata Solutions. I'm happy to answer questions. I'll take a look at the chat box on the right um, and we can address those. However, I'm, I'm free to chat about any, any questions, comments, concerns that there are about IVF itself, about the tools and technologies, the state of assisted re reproductive technologies, and also what is, what is the outlook of this space? What is happening in the next five to 10 years? Um, so look forward, look forward to being able to uh, chat some more in the, in the slide rooms. Let me check questions. Whoops. Okay. There we go. Let me pull this up. I'm sorry. Are they mark? Are they applications to the agricultural animal market? Yes, actually, that is one of our, our starting points. So when it comes to livestock, um, specifically cattle, what you see is that you have companies like Transova and Semtex, which uh, and I think there is Bova. There's something that starts with bovine, Bovatech. What they do is they'll take eggs from ranchers out all across the country, um, and Brazil is actually surpassing the United States in this at this point, but they'll take the eggs from these from these ranchers, a veterinarian is there, they ship them to a central site where these companies will then perform the IVF. And then what they do is they ship the cells back. So in that process, once they've done the IVF to when they want to ship the, the fertilized embryos back, what where we would get involved is we would eliminate those unfertilized embryos ever getting it to the customer. So rather than sending out 10 cells, they'll maybe send out eight, but all eight will be viable. The, benefit, the one downside of the livestock market was that there's so, it is so cheap to restart a livestock IVF um, that the cost that they're looking at was about a $500 savings um, per cell. So that's that's what we would be we'd be trying to price in. That's our margin and Transova's margin uh, to combine. So there's there's the one limitation. However, it is significant um, in that it still gets us the validation to be able to utilize our device in various different cell types, which is is data we need to collect um, on and the electrical data. Thank you, Carl. Excellent question. And if you know anyone at these companies, we'd love to we'd love to engage on that level as well. Okay, right, I don't you, see any more questions. Thank you. All right, the next presenter is Don. Don, are you ready to present? I most certainly am. How's everybody doing? Good. Nice. Can you guys hit me with a yes in the chat if you're still with me tonight? I know it's, these presentations can be long. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, having trouble sharing. Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. All right, so my name is Dawn Myers, founder and CEO at The Most, where we make hardware, that's physical product solutions that help women with highly textured, curly, coily, and kinky hair style faster, easier, and with more convenience. Now, I mean, look at this beautiful lady here. I love my curls. A lot of women, Black women, Hispanic women, Arab women, uh, Jewish women, white women who, with curly hair, everybody is, in, is really embracing their natural textures now. Um, but what people don't realize is that we do not wake up like this, okay? This takes a lot of work and a lot of time. A lot of women with highly textured hair say that texture 
Capture here is kind of like an extreme sport. It takes forever. I'm not even gonna go into the details here about everything that we go through behind the scenes to make this happen. There's detangling, there's uh, pre-pooing, there's uh, leave-in conditioners, there's layers of different products, there's detangling. It's a lot of work. Just take my word for it. And for some people, this takes up to, uh, for me, it takes about an hour and a half if I'm doing an easy kind of just, you know, just trying to walk out the door. Um, it can take me two hours if I'm really trying to be fancy. It takes some women exponentially more than that. And so, you know, this is really a huge pain point in the lives of women. Yeah, this is about beauty, but it's also about making our lives a little bit easier. Uh, imagine being a professional woman, imagine trying to stay healthy and work out, imagine trying to take care of your kids and your family and also having to spend three hours on your hair every time you wash. It's painful and we need solutions. And when you look at the R&D suites of all the major manufacturers, you've got tons of folks who really understand liquid products chemistry, but who don't understand the lives of the women that they're serving. Uh, and, you know, look, that's our major differentiator. I do. My team does we understand where the pain points are we understand where this very high spending niche isn't being served and you know look i've got curly hair i've watched all the women around me with curly hair try to navigate their careers and their families and we really need those solutions and so we're excited to get these to market um, you know, I'm taking all of my experience in law, um, in operations at some of the biggest kind of law firms and financial firms in the in the country to bring these uh, products to, uh, to fruition. And we're doing that with the most mint. Now the most mint uh, is this little product you see over here on the right. And you know, what we do is we have taken all of the elements of your wash day, um, all of the detangling tools, uh, your brushes, your combs, all of the implements. We've taken all of those bulky containers of oils and gels and curl creams, and we've rolled it up into one really portable uh, kind of streamlined solution that does all the work for you. You, right so rather than having to figure out okay do I do this step first and do I do tangle first before I do the gel we give you the roadmap all you got to do is run this you know really cool appliance through your hair and you're getting uh, conditioned minted curls even faster and we call it the mint because it mints those curls down into place just like you would mint a penny All right, uh, so you know the value add here is really simple. We're cutting time and we're making this process even, uh, it just making the user experience a lot better. So we're cutting styling time. For me, I'm cutting styling time in about half. Obviously, uh, the amount of time that we cut per consumer depends on the length of their hair, the consistency of their hair, their texture, um, you know, how many products they tend to use, et cetera. Um, but what we're really focused here on is getting just as much time value for our customers as possible. Um, we're also increasing, again, the user experience right now. This is a very messy process. There are products all over the place. It's just, it's really uh, not pretty. And so we're making that even better. And then on top of that, we're improving hair health. And we do that with the use of these really cool uh, cartridges that you see here. We call these the most minis. And they come pre-filled with liquid products of the user's choice. You snap it into place, as you can see here. The tool very gently warms those liquid products, um, which is a really critical step in uh, Afro textured hair maintenance, but we often skip it because it's just, it takes a lot more time. Uh, and then, as you can see, these detanglers here uh, really uh, kind of detangle your hair while you're pumping that conditioned liquid product onto your hair, onto your hair getting that minted curl even faster uh, than, you're, uh, than you're able to do manually. And, you know, we've introduced these minis, but it's really important for us to drill down on this so you guys can understand the really the power of these renewables. So, um, you know, we've seen renewables in coffee with Keurig. We've seen it with Dollar Shave Club, but we haven't seen it in hair yet. And, you know, these, uh, these minis really help us do things like travel. Um, we can style on the go. You can put, uh, you know, a couple of these minis in your luggage or in your gym bag. You can put your tool, your mint tool into your gym bag 
bag and you can style on the go, which is really new for us. Normally we're kind of stuck in front of our vanities or in our bathroom mirrors. And it's very difficult for us to uh, kind of take all of those pieces of the puzzle of the styling puzzle with us. But with our system, uh, we make it easier and more convenient. And you know, there are tons of uh, hair products on the market. There are tons of tools on the market, but none of them are hitting our key uh, pain points. A lot of them, you know, focus on things like steaming or diffusing. Uh, but, you know, we've surveyed almost 200 women and done deep interviews with almost 200 women. And those women have very consistently indicated that that real pain point is the process of detangling and product application, which the market is just completely missing. Um, as you can see, the kind of tools in the market go up to $500. Um, that's become kind of the kind of luxury price point. Uh, we're selling at $200. So we're right in there uh, exactly where we need to be for new kind of luxury uh, uh, tech item. Uh, and our market size is pretty profuse. We're looking at an $87 billion uh, market. And, uh, you know, we're having conversations right now with QVC. We're having conversations with Procter & Gamble. Uh, the market is really thirsty to figure this problem out, but they haven't been able to do that. Why? Because there aren't a whole lot of people with highly textured hair who are in those R&D suites. And so we're really excited to capitalize um, on all this momentum. Now, uh, our business model, what you really want to kind of take away here is that, yeah, we're selling tools, but we're really focused on the scalability of uh, our renewable minis. So uh, throughout the years, over the next five years, we see, obviously, year to year, there are going to be shifts, but generally, we're seeing about, uh, we're projecting about 50% of our sales going to the most mint. Um, and, but the other 50% is really coming from our renewables and our, eventually, our renewable subscriptions. And those subscriptions are really kind of where this becomes really robust. We're currently, one of our advisors is brokering partnerships with other liquid product uh, products on our liquid product brands that are already on the market. And that becomes really powerful um, when we are one, providing a service, providing a product that really fills a gaping white space in the market while also being able to piggyback on the momentum of other brands that are already on the market and that we know our consumers are really uh, attracted to and loyal to. So, you know, we've done uh, four rounds of product development over the past two years to really get this to a place where we can commercialize it. And we're fundraising now to be able to commercialize our technology and get it on the market. Our traction has been fantastic just in the past year. We've accumulated over 10,000 followers on our social media channels. Um, we just finished our Sephora Accelerate program. Uh, we, you know, just finished with NextFab, which we're really proud of. We're patent pending. We filed our PCTs. We have won national pitch competitions. We've gotten tons of press. We've got incredible partnerships with some of the most prolific people in our space, which we'll tell you more about shortly. Uh, but suffice it to say, we are really um, excited to capitalize on all of that momentum to get this to market. Now let's dig into uh, the unit economics here. So as I mentioned, we just finished our Sephora retail cohort um, where we dug into uh, retail and you know what, a, what conservative estimates we can expect uh, going into this. And we think we're very comfortable that over the next five years, we, can, we should be moving at least 100,000 units. In that first year, we're looking at moving um, a, com a total of 10,000 units over uh, direct to consumer, uh, trade shows and retail relationships. Our MSRP is $200 per unit, and we would be selling at a blended price to uh, retailers uh, and distributors at $120. Um, we are looking at a cost uh, to, to make each unit at about $45, so we're still looking at a healthy margin. Uh, even while we're still producing relatively small batches, obviously we want to get that, you know, cost of production down even further thereafter, but even to start, we still got healthy margins that we're looking at. Our price per mini is $3, but our subscription model would put us at $12 per month for up to six minis, which would give our consumers a really attractive 30% uh, percent, uh, discount. And as you can see, it's that scalability that's really grounded uh, the kind of our projected sales there. So as I mentioned, we have an incredible team um, that I'm really proud of. 
with all kinds of expertise from marketing to uh, data to uh, legal to operations, uh, you know, who have come together to really make uh, this go. And we're really uh, just working hard every day uh, to make this work. And our advisors are incredible. Uh, Tristan Walker, one of the most prolific black uh, entrepreneurs uh, today. In fact, I just got a ping recently that he was literally just um, appointed to the board at Shake Shack. He is one of the, he is the only black CEO to ever be under the P&G umbrella. Um, he is the only black CEO who has a focus on hardware and he's you know, advising us. So we're really proud to have these guys on our team. These are the use of funds. These are, you know, the funds that we're planning on raising. But of course, you know, from you guys today, we're really looking for partnerships and people who can advise us in the hair space. And, you know, we're really excited about the disruptive potential of uh, this offering. And I'm really excited to take you guys as questions. Great job. Thank you, Don. Thank Any you. questions for Don? I think we have time for one or two questions. <laughs> I see, I see uh, Gary sounds like he knows uh, Founder Jim. Great to see that. Yeah, shout out to you, you killed it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's see, could you please send me a copy of your pitch deck? I'd like to, yeah, of course. I would love to send you more information. I'll just make sure to get your uh, information before we uh, exit out of here. And I'll send my information here as well. Let's see, how can I help you right now? <laughs> John Mercer, I can't see your hair, but we can definitely talk offline. We're actually, the most has actually launched uh, a completely new website and we are responding to all the needs of our consumers right now who are stuck at home in COVID and who can't get their hair done. Um, and so we're giving people tools and, trips and tip, tips and tricks on how to give themselves hair trims, how to do conditioning, how to do treatments at home. And so hopefully we can provide some value right now. Awesome. I mean, this humidity is killing me today. It's the longest <laughs> my hair has ever been. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I can help you. It looks great. It looks super awesome. healthy, but I can definitely Thank see you. if you can help. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Can you share your uh, website and email address? Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. All right. So we, um, the next presenter is John. John, are you able to share your screen? Yep, absolutely. Let me try. Awesome. Let me know when you guys can see it. We can see it. Fantastic. All right. First of all, you know, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Everyone did so well. It's going to be hard to uh, compete with everyone, um, but very excited. Um, hi, everyone. My name's John Lawless. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Volta Therapeutics. And I'm here today to share a little bit about our story, how we came from a Drexel University uh, senior design project all the way to the startup company that we are through the help of UPenn, the Singh Center for Nanotechnology, where we uh, kicked off our project with the help of NextFab uh, to build our hardware and software uh, to actually make this happen uh, and ultimately create a gene modified cell therapy technology that can bring that to the patient's bedside. Now that's a big, uh, big thing there, gene modified cell therapy. You know, what is that? Uh, genetically modified cells for the treatment of disease. That's what I went to school for. And it's the, uh, the concept there, you see the little cell. It's the concept of using a cell as a treatment rather than uh, traditional pharmaceuticals. And so that's really where our startup and our senior design project based our, our problem on. We kind of discovered that there were huge problems in the industry. Um, and one of those being that these were not like traditional uh, pharmaceuticals. When you think about treatments for disease, you think about chemistry, uh, you think about pills that can be done in large and industrial processes, but these are actually living drugs, uh, they're cells. So you have to do it in a complex and delicate way. And I direct your eyes to the bottom there. This is the general workflow for how you would uh, choose a cell, select cells from a body, genetically modify them, typically grow them to a potent level and then test them for safety. You make sure that that cell is doing what it's supposed to do before you put it back into the person's body. Uh, so really what that happens is that that's such a complex process, right? And all of those different instruments that you see there are required to do that. 
Now imagine the level of complexity, you add a layer there, how much product variation there might be in the market. There's 200 human cells, uh, you know, cells in the human body. So you think about all these different companies that are making some type of cell therapy, some type of cell, liver, blood. Uh, there's so many that there could be. And that creates a huge problem with the complexity, another layer that ultimately creates limited patient access, which is one of the biggest issues. It's not a cheap prescription we're talking about here. This is a personalized medicine. Uh, this is a high cost, almost $500,000 for an infusion of uh, one of the latest and greatest treatments, which is CAR T therapy. It's an engineered T cell that can attack cancer and kill it. Really promising, but very expensive. So what are we hoping to do here at Volta? Uh, similar to Dawn, we're shooting for something that's all in one, putting everything into a single solution, uh, turning all of those different pieces of equipment that you saw on that previous slide into a simple cartridge that you can drag and drop, something that's flexible, modular, you can almost do it for every type of cell therapy product that you can imagine. That's really what we're going for here is this all in one gene modification cell therapy device. Now, there are some people that do this in the market. There are some big players in the game, Lonza, Milteni, Draper are just a few to name. Uh, what they do and, and what you see at the bottom there is those generic workflows. They work through cell isolation, genetic modification, cell growth. A lot of them don't perform the testing that's necessary for you to actually show the safety and then put it back in the person's body. That's typically PCR and other types of QC tests. Now, what we hope to do is actually go end to end, because how do you bring that to the patient's bedside? You have to cover the whole spectrum of the process. And in order to do that, you really need the QC testing. That would be one of the modules that we hope to incorporate in our technology platform and really ultimately bring that to the point of care. And in essence, that's putting all of those pieces of equipment into a box, a lab on a box, if you will, uh, maybe even including advanced technology internet of things and then ultimately uh, one of the biggest issues that they have is that these are configured for T cells alone that CAR T therapy that I was talking about because that is the current uh, FDA approved drug in the market so that's an engineered T cell for cancer we're hoping to do this again for all cell types over 200 and really expand this to a universal platform for cell therapy now, how far have we come? Uh, development and traction. The, on the development side, we were able to hook up with Noah Clay. He's a close friend and advisor now over at the Singh Center for Nanotechnology. What he was able to do is actually help us connect with the faculty and the team there to develop our first cartridge or module. So what you're seeing in the center there is our cartridge. It's a little uh, view under the hood, if you will, with our gene delivery elements and cell isolator elements. It's magnetic based uh, cell isolation. So that would be our first cartridge of many that we hope to create. And uh, in partnership with NextFab, a big shout out to them. We were able to make the hardware with Todor, you know, uh, Matt Bell, Corey, Alex, big shout out to them again. Uh, luckily, we'll, we'll hopefully replace this image with a full-blown system uh, that we can ultimately give to our other advisor, Dr. Friata, uh, where we hope to gain significant traction with UPenn. So Dr. Friata worked alongside Carl June, uh, if you know that name. He was a big player in the game, started Juno Therapeutics that was bought out for uh, billions of dollars, uh, actually, I think multiple times bought out. Uh, and he also works in the Advanced Cancer Center, Perlman Center, for advanced uh, therapy. And what we hope to do there is eventually translate this technology into clinical applications for CAR-T under his advice. And we're hoping to expand this board and develop more traction with other universities, other CAR-T programs, and potentially other cell therapy programs as well. So how do we get there? Uh, what, what are the goals in the timeline? The idea was this actually started as our senior design project again. That was the early round of the cartridge round, 10 grand with the Singh Center an NSF grant spinoff that we got. And then with NextFab 20 grand, we were able to put that all together uh, in a very lean fashion actually and create this low volume system that we're very excited to hand over to Dr. Friata. He'll begin uh, generating some data for us, which is very exciting. We'll I think we lost him. Yeah, John, I think we lost you. Now? Yeah. We can hear you now. Yeah, you're good, John. My internet connection is unstable. My apologies, guys. So you can hear me. Okay, great. So uh, wherever I was, uh, I'll, you know, I'll pick up with the next fab. So you see Q4 there, 2020, that's where we're, we're at. Uh, in sum, we really hope to combine the cartridge and the hardware from NextFab to create that low volume system, hand that over to Dr. Friato UPenn, uh, generate data, 
Following that, uh, pushing into next year, hopefully COVID uh, won't set us back any further, we'll get 250K and really expand that to a higher volume system and show proof of principle. And with that proof of principle, we'll show that we can create clinical volumes of CAR T cells that can kill cancer, engineered T cells. Really expand this, maybe also do some scaling and give this to other universities for other programs, other data. Um, and then with that data, we'll, we'll get some patents as well. We'll shoot for a series A, we'll expand the modules, maybe do adherent cells and other cell types, and then ultimately go for that point of care, um, expand the technology with internet of things and really bring this to like an arm to arm or vein to vein solution for cellular engineering, if you will. So that's the really exciting path that we're shooting for. When it comes to the business model, how do we make money? Uh, what we got from the customers that we've spoken to is that we should approach it with FDA labeling for research use only. They actually want it for research use. There's a couple benefits to us. One of them being that uh, we don't have to do clinical trials. We can just do a filing with the FDA a device history file, and then we can work with them uh, too to uh, generate data. What they wanna do is play with it and actually generate data to show clinical significance and move this into trials on their own. Um, what that would look like is selling cartridges and attachments to them by the box load, if you will, um, an operations deck or enclosure. So that's where you would plug and play those cartridges. You would customize that to your process with all the product variation that you might see with software and annual licenses. So that's a big money maker there. And then possibly also installation services with field engineers might also be a chance for licensing within the model. Uh, so really significant opportunity there. And then when we talk about the global market, this is global, it's around the world. There's over 600 cell therapy organizations worldwide um, with nearly over a hundred doing CAR T therapy alone as a niche within that cell therapy market. And there's about 650 clinical trials for pretty much all uh, cell therapy there. So the big question is where do we start? Uh, it's a big mission, big undertaking for every cell therapy. Uh, those 200 cells again is such an overwhelming idea, but the ideas will start with CAR T therapy with our connections and pioneers at UPenn who, who invented CAR T therapy. Uh, and ultimately we can hopefully get that into the hands of some big players in the game, Celgene, Pfizer, Novartis, the, the folks that you see there, they're all building their own CAR T platforms now. There's over a hundred, as I mentioned. So with that level of traction, uh, getting our foot in the door and then hopefully expanding it with other universities and these other big institutions doing CAR T, that's really where we hope to uh, kick things off. So this is just my big shout out to the Volta team. You see myself, uh, Pav, and a lot of us uh, did BSMS. I was not, I was busy doing uh, this instead, which I'm very excited about anyways. Uh, but big shout out to them, uh, all of us from the senior design group to the startup company that we've become and then hopefully beyond. Uh, big shout out once again, couldn't have done it without them. And I think with this team, we'll definitely be able to get it into the hands of Dr. Friata, the guys at Penn. Uh, we'll continue to expand this technology development, our modules, and hopefully make a big change for cell therapy and create this all-in-one solution uh, that can be used to engineer cells. So thank you so much for having me again. Really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. And I'll take any questions. You can follow us, Facebook, LinkedIn. I can send this out. Those are all hyperlinks there. Uh, Volta-Therapeutics is our website. You can check us out. Great. Thank you, John. Any questions for John? Absolutely. Like there's something in the chat there. All right, folks, if you don't have any questions for John and his team right now, we'll have some virtual um, info tables after the end of these um, presentations. So stay tuned for more information about that. Um, actually, there is one. Yeah, uh, that's what I was gonna mention. I just saw that pop up. Can you quantify cost savings compared to current methods? Uh, so that's hard to quantify now, uh, but it would be on the order of, you know, thousands of dollars for, for boxes of these cartridges. Um, software and things like that, you're talking pretty expensive, but this is a platform for an entire organization. So typically with software licenses, um, it's on the order of thousands annually per user, things like that. Uh, but that would be tremendous. You know, it would be maybe on the order of 500,000 to maybe millions of dollars per deal with these larger organizations. Um, the idea there is that that extends for maybe a year and, and we would generate revenue on that per customer, uh, maybe even more money than that. But to, to go a little bit in the background of the current issues and cost, it's really a supply chain issue. Uh, so what happens is you draw blood in the CAR-T model, let's say. Uh, you draw blood from the patient 
and then you actually ship that way over to a, a manufacturer who does this process in a clean room. So you're talking a huge level of infrastructure with low capacity. Uh, you need a personalized suite. There might be like, let's say 30 in a building. So you could do about 30 patients and the process takes about four months. It's like 30 patients a month. Uh, all of that processing, the head count, the logistics, and then your cryopreserving cells, which is a huge issue with liquid nitrogen. So when we're talking about the current model, it's the supply chain, it's, it's the overhead, contract manufacturing, things like that. And the benefits that you can imagine bringing it next to the patient's bedside at that point, it's consumables and subscription, you know, uh, cert, like licenses, uh, software, things like that. And it would really shift the paradigm of that model from a decentralized, you know, contract manufacturing type of solution into a centralized uh, type of solution that sits at the clinic, sits next to the patient's bedside. And that's really where we hope to shoot for um, kind of creating a ripple effect in cost, which is really hard to quantify currently, but that's something we're looking into. There is one more question from Evan. Can you see it? Yeah, does Philly have a technical resource uh, to support our business development? So um, that's actually maybe a good question uh, that I can bring back to Andre and get back to you. But uh, when it comes to business development, we've been working with NextFab and that's been tremendous for us. On the software side, we do have software engineering friends. Uh, we've got a huge actually friend group from Drexel that are all engineers ready to jump in. We're just not ready for the software yet. We're still working on the hardware, the device. Um, and we'll be running it with like an R&D based, uh, you know, type of software that Dr. Friata will use and generate data for us. We're very early on. We're looking for 250K. Yeah, um, I mean, I, John, I can jump in if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. And, and whoever asked that question, it's a very excellent question because you're dealing with a lot of samples here and with the added, I guess, with the added effect of having all these cartridges, there is a lot of QA and, and obviously QC that has to be employed here. So John and I have actually had extensive conversations with a few data scientists uh, where we might actually be using blockchain technology uh, to track all of these things. So, I mean, there has been a lot of thought that has gone into that. It's just right now we're so focused on actually having the hardware, getting the data generated from the actual electroporation itself so that we could come back to you guys, you know, the investors and be like, all right, here's the data, it works. Now let's build a system that can facilitate this for patients. Yeah, and then we've got you know um, Noah Clay from a technical perspective um, and his huge network from the microfab and the the scale up space. So our cartridges, um, we're really looking into scaling that as the next part of this. Uh, with that 250k, we'll find foundries that can do that at, at a cheaper cost than what we're doing it now. Um, the hardware, um, pretty cheap for us to do, and we've got great um, advice under our scope of work and, and with the guidance of everyone at NextFab. And then the software is really, I think, the missing link there um, to really put our package together and create some type of commercialized solution that we could do. And that's really where we're going with the 250K. Um, create that final true MVP, if you will, uh, that can actually be given to universities and, and potentially get letters of intent and things like that. They can start generating data. We'll have white papers and more patents at that point. And that's really where we'll, we'll really shoot for a series A and have more support for that valuation that we're doing. Great, thank you so much, John. I think we are right on time. I, I have one more slide and we can move to the next uh, session. I'm not sure if you can see my screen right now. I just wanted to congratulate you all for graduating from, from this program. Even though, I mean, there were many challenges due to the COVID-19 crisis. I think you made a ton of progress and we're extremely happy with, with, with the progress you made. And we are excited to see what is going to happen next with your companies. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we now have um, another application cycle uh, is going to open tomorrow. So folks who are on this call who might be building hardware companies, or if you know of anybody who might be building a hardware company, uh, you can visit this, uh, this link and you can apply until August 21st. Um, we're going to review the application. Uh, we typically have about 100 applicants and only four or five companies end up, uh, in the program. So if you know of somebody who might be interested in talking or if you'd like to learn more about this program, we will have some virtual info tables um, after this presentation. So Natalie, I think you, know, you might be able to tell us more about that. Yep, 
So um, Venture Cafe is a social networking space that replaces kind of our in-person networking um, while we're virtual is called Remo. Um, and I am going to pop a link into the chat for um, where Remo will be and where um, all these companies will be um, sitting at their tables and happy to answer questions. So here is the link to that. Um, one thing I will say, Remo does put a limit on the number of people who can be at an information table at any given point. Um, it's between six and eight. I think that um, Remo recently upped the number to eight, but it may still just be six. Um, so please, um, if you're heading over to that space, um, the companies will be on the second floor. So that'll make more sense once you get there. Um, you'll come into the first floor, navigate to the second floor, and then you'll see all the company names on the tables. Um, and then you can move around to um, the different tables and talk to um, the, the company, the companies. So um, if you want to head over there, um, I just put the link into the chat. Um, please let the entrepreneurs um, get to their tables first, just so they don't get locked out of their own tables. Um, and then uh, feel free to join them over there. So um, we look forward to seeing you all there. See you guys over there. For joining us. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Hope to see you over there. Yeah. Thank you so much.